Hello and welcome everyone to the main event. I am Mita Sani of the main group and I'm so pleased to see the return and welcoming back our special guest Joe Ellen Grizzip of the Impact Factory. Joe Ellen, hi, welcome. Oh back. hi, it's great. I was looking in my diary. The last one I did with you is July 7th. Wow. So it's actually been quite a while. So I've missed it. I've come to your events, but I've mm -hmm. I've missed being on this side of the uh of the stage, as it were. Oh, well, it's fabulous to have you back by my side um, as everyone's jumping in. I know we always have a mixed audience of, of our regulars and also some new attendees. So welcome back to all of our regular attendees and uh, welcome to our new attendees. Um, Joellen picked today's topic and it couldn't be more topical and timely. It's, it's all about quiet quitting. And I put a heading saying that it's possible that quite quitting could cost you your team and your bottom line and i know that might sound a little extreme but joellen we're going to be talking for the next 30 or 40 minutes it's an interactive session we want comments we want uh, messages we want whatever you have to say we want you to say it because these sessions are for you but joellen why did you think that this is, is such a, a key uh, topic to be discussing right now well you know we keep looking at some of the uh, knock-on effects of the pandemic and we, you and I have had discussions before about, you know, hybrid working and, and being forced to come back into the office and things like that, mm. quiet quitting, which has been around for a long time and unions call it work to rule. But apparently it's been, I keep reading more and more and more about it. <clears throat> there was some Gallup poll that 50% of Americans in the workplace are doing quiet quitting. That seems high, but I, I suspect it's probably a bit of a white collar um crime if you want yeah. to say yeah. uh, behavior um office based uh, definitely definitely is a knock on effect to people over the pandemic having more awareness of their mental health of taking care of themselves yeah. and the response and particularly apparently for the gen z and millennials quiet quitting is it now it's very hard for me i have been a quiet quitter of anything i'm a very noisy person when i don't like a situation so mm. it's it's a it's a bizarre thing to me but yes. i thought i would do a little bit more research and like there was a, a couple of good articles in the harvard business review that looked at the idea that quiet quitting is about bad managers, not bad employees. So there are yeah. two sides to it, definitely. Yeah, well, that's something I definitely feel um, the pandemic has also thrown out is these, these phrases, you know, the great resignation, quiet quitting. But actually, if you look under the surface of what's going on, nothing is new. None of the, Im not the impact of of quiet quitting isn't a new phenomenon it's just been branded with a new title and as you said it's probably for different reasons that people are now essentially disengaging yeah. and what i love about today is we're going to be talking i'm going to cover the few areas that we said we'll cover um i did also skim over the housekeeping so let me just say that in more detail in case I'm, this is somebody's first time the main events are usually 30 to 40 minutes long. We like to keep them succinct and we like to keep them high value. We know how uh, time is precious, but we also know that when we come, when someone joins these sessions, usually they've got an interest, but also a, a, maybe a niggling challenge on the ground. So we hope that you can get that answer and take that back and, and apply it and, and affect positive outcomes in your in your place of work. Um, hence why the comments are so important. I'm going to try and post a little hello here just to show you how easy it is to interact and uh, give us your thoughts and comments and questions also a lot of people sign up but then don't get to attend and then watch the recording after so we will make sure that anyone that has signed up gets the recording and after that our recordings live on YouTube if you want to watch or Spotify if you just want to listen. So there's many ways to interact with, with the content uh, from our session today. Um, but Joellen and, and I have covered, um, we're covering a few areas. First and foremost, I guess, why it's now, uh, you know, a buzzword, why is quiet quitting a buzzword? Why is it getting traction? And then looking at it from a, an employee perspective. So, you know what's really happening when someone quietly quits let's get into the into the minds of your employees because 
we can identify the challenge. Um, I feel like I'm talking very fast because I'm so excited to get into the content, but I am going <laughs> to slow down and say that if we can understand the challenges that our employees are facing, their perspective, then we can start to effect solutions. Um, and then finally, looking at the implications for the workplace, for bosses. You mentioned the HBR talking about problem managers, not problem employees. And well, that that's an age old challenge, isn't it? It is. And actually, I don't think you can define it one way or the other. Personally, I think that, you know, we do know that communication is key. And um, some people in some of the articles that I've read about quiet quitting saying, you know, they've they've asked for a raise or they've asked for different conditions or they've asked to work from home and they haven't got it. And so they just said, all right, well, I'm just withdrawing. Um, for me, that's quite an immature reaction um, as though that is that you're it's like walking out of a room when you're having an argument with someone. It doesn't get resolved. It's, it? it's like, OK, yeah. and 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 what? Um, uh, so, but I also think there's something about, you know, if we look at it from the employer side is, you know, someone may in their mind have left already, but their body is still there and they may be doing the minimum. Yeah. Um, and are you as a manager aware that you've got either a bored or a discontent yeah. or an angry employee? Yeah. Um, and are you doing anything about it? And then yeah. of course, you've got the implications for your colleagues, um, yes, the impact. Your, you're just for your. I mean, I. I that's what I say. I, uh, if I've been, if I haven't liked a job, I've left. Or I mean, I've either said, "What can I do to improve it?" Or I've left. Yeah, I, I think, I think that at the moment, what's happening, and again, quite quitting is when I first heard the heard the um, the, the the phrase, I. Oh, well, we've got the great resignation and actually it's only when you read underneath that actually quiet quitting is about staying in your role but disengaging essentially isn't it which is why we know that it's not a new phenomenon it's just accelerated because as you said people have had an awake people have had a conscious awakening and they've had that because they've had the time to actually reflect they've people worked from home well we got thrown from you know, essentially this five days a week in the office structure that we were imprisoned in because we didn't question it. We accepted it as standard. On occasion, people would ask for a four day week or some flexibility. It was very rarely uh, embraced as it is now. And I think, you know, what would have taken years to, to, to become the norm has taken two years. And, you know, Joellen, I was doing a training session on um, successful hybrid working last week. And one of the statistics that, or one of the facts that really interested me was that actually the first time any structure was put into work was nearly a hundred years ago when Henry Ford created the nine to five. Right. And he right. created that to attract talent and just to speed up the production on his, his work lines, on his um, car production line. And so for whatever reason, a hundred years on, Flexible working, hybrid working, remote working, all of these new norms, again, are being utilised by employers, one, as, a, 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 as an attraction tool, but also people are tall, people are speaking, people yeah. are quietly quitting, they are resigning, they are choosing companies that offer flexibility over full time yeah. in. And I think what you said about why wouldn't people just leave? which is what, you know, we think, well, make a decision, I'm off. But I think there's too much flux out there in the world at the moment. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I was a little facetious, you know, <laughs> just leave, because I know that, that jobs can be difficult to get. I think it is the fact that it's how we communicate what it is that we need and want. And I think that, for me, the positive, if people actually see it and use it as a positive, is that if my mental health and my physical health and the health of my family, if I have one, is around having better working conditions for myself, which aren't necessarily the nine to five box. Yeah. That's a good thing. It means that I am looking at how I take care of myself. I think where I have the difficulty is how are you doing it? What's the impact on the business? What's the impact on your pride? What's the impact on your colleagues? 
what esteem do you have if, if you're just going to sit back and say, I'm going to do the minimum? We yeah. also have the question of job descriptions. Now, you and I have talked before about job descriptions can be really great because oh. they give a, a, a powerful boundary. But if you're working to rule or whatever term you want to use, quietly quitting, one of the things that in any job I have ever done, you know, and I'm going to be 75 next year, no. next month, sorry, next month, you know, working with colleagues was always beyond my job description. It, mm. it wasn't like, and you will work with colleagues. It was somehow we were all in it together, whatever mm. job. And my happiest jobs were when there was a sense of collaboration, a sense of continuity, a sense of enjoying each other's company and helping each other out. And somehow quiet quitting could take, could put you on a, on the back foot in terms of, well, I'm just going to do this. And, and where does that leave your colleagues? Where does yeah. that leave um, that collaborative spirit? So yeah. I think there are a lot of questions. I don't think there are any easy answers to this, but it yeah. does bring up a lot of questions. Yeah, it, it does. And we're, we're definitely at the more questions stage, although we do have some answers, but I do still think it's a work in progress. So I'm going to try and engage with our, our attendees today and just ask if, if anyone is out there, I'd love to just hear a yes or a no about whether you are experiencing or seeing any of this going on in your organization. So these are some of the, because um, I'd also like to make sure the chat box is working. I'm still relatively new to, to the LinkedIn approach. I used to be on, on Webinar Jam, which was much easier. So essentially, these are the six uh, sort of uh, traits of um, quite quitting. First of all, chronic disengagement. So people performing only to the bare minimum, um, again, which is why the job description is so important to have clarity on what good looks like. Not uh, not, not collaborating with the members of the business so much, the members of the team more isolated, perhaps working from home more, um, not getting involved in any non-necessary tasks, conversations, activities, people that might attend meetings but not speaking up or taking any action anymore. Um, teammates feeling like their workload has increased because other people have dropped engagement and therefore teammates are picking up slag. So if you have had any of those uh, in your world, let, let us know. And uh, if you haven't, then just a no would be great too. I believe there might be a bit of a delay on the chat box too. So go for it and hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll see some comments. Um, but but jo Joellen, do you feel that's a comprehensive set of uh, indicators or do you think there's others that haven't been covered? Well, uh, for me, it's something around, which I mentioned earlier about how are you communicating? So have you communicated with management or your boss, your line manager and been rebuffed? So are you, what feelings are you harboring? Yeah. Um, so I think that you looked at behaviors, which is right. I think that underneath that, it will be resentment, exhaustion, fragility, stress, anxiety, any number of things that could be feeding something that perhaps is another solution to it. Yeah. Yay, somebody's here. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Sally says yes. Thank you, Sally. If you can put any more meat on the bone, that would be great. Apologies to all the vegans if I've just said meat on the bone. Um, but, um, you know, it, it it's it's one of those gut feelings as well. I think, you know, businesses, as we've come back out of the pandemic, a lot of organisations contracted and then are building out again. Yeah. It's really key to check that every process and policy and procedure you have in place is still fit for purpose. And actually, I feel that for the impact on our employees, revisiting performance management, revisiting how you engage your employees, revisiting what you stand for. People want to be part of some people want to feel that they're doing important stuff. Yeah. And sometimes the role content might not reflect that. But I think it's our job as employers and people leaders to demonstrate the value proposition of what you're doing in the bigger context, whether it's sustainability, 
whether it's the cultural and value system that you create a network and community of in your workplace, um, or what you stand for in terms of ED, ED, EDIB, equality, diversity, inclusion, and belonging in your workplace. And you know, this is where I think we can learn so much from the charity and not-for-profit world. Yeah. Sitting in the middle at the main group, I see what our charity clients do and what our commercial clients do. And I have to say that I think the commercial world are really improving their uh, why, you know, who we are, what we stand for, which the charity world and the not-for-profit world have done as standard because yeah. it says on the door, you know, yeah. this is what we're about. And I think that that allows people to, 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 to opt in and, and find it easy to find that connection. Yeah, I think absolutely. I, I'm I'm such a believer. An impact factory is around purpose. What is my purpose in life, and is it being fulfilled in which areas? Yeah. And we're again going back to that nine to five paradigm, that patriarchal paradigm. How we've evolved in terms of, or not evolved in terms yeah. of, of the workplace. Things have been. We keep saying the pandemic has thrown that all up into the air. And people are saying, um, what is my sense of purpose? Why am I here? What am I doing? And I think you rightly said, it may not be your specific job that's exciting you in terms of, oh, I'm, I'm being stretched to my creative limit, but I'm part of something that is doing wonderful things or interesting things or provocative things. And so I can feel a sense of fulfillment of my purpose within that. Yeah. Um, but I think it. what I like about, you know, again, the positives is where are we questioning and how are we questioning our role in the workplace? And this comes back to communication. I did, I've been sort of, I have a lovely friend who I've been, you know, friend coaching and she's been having trouble at work. Now she is the last quiet quitter type I know. I mean, she would never, she's just too energetic and, you know, and loves yeah. her colleagues and all of that. And we were looking at a strategy because she can't get through her immediate boss. She just keeps coming up against, and, and what it is is she's, the whole team is overwhelmed by the amount of work they do and the lack of resources. Mm. And she said, I just feel like just doing the minimum. And I said, oh, quiet quitting. <laughs> and she said, I've never done the minimum in my life. And, I, and so we looked at a different way, which was perhaps communicating with her boss's boss. And she said, oh, I, I get on with him quite well. And I said, it's not about accusing. It's just about talking about your aspirations within the organization and how, you know, how you would like to, what kind of support you could get. And so she's taken that tactic. Um, so she's bypassed her boss and just kind of invited her boss's boss for, a, you know, a walk around the building kind of thing and just told him that, you know, how much she enjoys working there and she's got great colleagues and that she has some ambitions that she'd love to be able to share with him. Yeah. So nobody is in the wrong. And yet she's found a way to manage all that feeling that she had, which is what she wanted to do was just, I'll just sit here and do the minimum. Yeah. Well, we talk about the implications for the workplace, the bosses, bosses, the colleagues. And actually I think you've picked on something really key for quite quitting. And I think that is again, something, every organization should look at is their mental program are they able to create and the largest and smallest organizations can do this and reverse mentoring is great as well because you Absolutely. know more experienced and you know people who are not gen z but might be baby boomers can learn from a gen zer and putting them together they both share and exchange Absolutely, and i think that is so powerful and if one is disengaged, coaching is fantastic. But I think for organizations, sometimes it's, it's important to understand what's going on before you can bring the solutions. And we can give the whole list of performance management tools. And but I think, you know, let's start with, as you said, Joellen, communicating. Start with your line manager. If there isn't a line manager, if that doesn't work, look at who else in the organization might be able to help. But I think it's really key for um, uh, employers and you know people responsible for HR to do some form of uh, employee engagement surveys. It could be a how motivated are you to come to work this week? 
Yeah. And literally one question, these days texts are great. You know, you can do a poll and a text. It's a number, it takes seconds to do, but it gives you so much direction as an employer. Um, and that might be the way to do it. You might just want to, you know, rather than throw 10 questions out there, throw two, throw three, do it in a really easy way, do it anonymously. And I think that's great. I love that idea. I think that one of the things we were talking about recently, the um, sort of senior team, was that in many ways, organizations ha are catching up with where they are now. So mm -hmm. I'm very aware that Impact Factory, like pretty much any organization of a similar size or larger, whatever, during the pandemic, we were firefighting. Those yeah. of us who survived have been firefighting. And I think that the shift from a firefighting uh, operation yeah. into whether you want it to be growth or stability or whatever, or thriving or abundance, whatever yeah. term getting you want back to use. Getting back you, to have to, you, have to, you have to have a different attitude. And mm -hmm. I think that those who are, who are still in firefighting mode are actually have a quite limited blinkered mindset because it's like okay i have to deal with this problem as opposed to what's what's the workplace arena that i want to create what's the feeling that i want people to have what's the responsibilities that i want to share out because yeah. i think most organizations are probably beyond the firefighting mode and need to go into a different mode which does require a more broader mindset. Yeah. Broader, a broader mindset uh, yeah a broader vision a broader mindset long-term proactive thinking understanding the implications of what's happening now on the future plan and I and that has to be led by senior leadership it has to come from a a, a vision a long-term plan a short-term plan sharing that with your employees on the ground um, at their level helping them understand their role within the bigger picture, incentivizing on a personal level. I think rewards and benefits is another space that businesses could, and uh, organizations could really think about how their um, rewards and benefits are aligned to the drivers of their people. I know for us personally, I'm currently researching sabbaticals and looking at how we can bring sabbaticals into our rewards and benefits package. I'm also very conscious that one size doesn't fit all. And again, it's important for managers to be able to have that, you know, yes, have your uh, polls and your anonymous polls, but also back to what we really got good at in lockdown was checking in. Yes. Even though we're all back to work and we're all hybrid, actually, I think hybrid working takes up, well, not initially, but but the, the, the continuity of hybrid working takes up more headspace than we realize and in some ways more headspace than five days a week because five days a week in and that's because you are shifting your pattern of work you are having to bring a set of tools and armor and, and proactiveness that is different I think most people work like two like I'm a Tuesday and Thursday girl that means Monday Wednesday Friday I'm at home and I've got that approach and then Tuesday and Thursday I've got to shift gear and that shift is causing me challenge and I've never experienced that and I thought, am yeah. I anxious am I quite quitting my own business that I own no it's <laughs> recognizing that it's different now and I think that's really important for employees managers speaking to employees is getting under the skin of you know have we have you reflected what are you doing when when you start to feel good what are you doing when you start to feel you know low and what days do you feel good is there a continue because i actually think you'll be able to pick up patterns that you can help them overcome absolutely uh, right before this i i sit on a board uh, an advisory board of a a, a group a charity well no a cic that um does work with young people in giving them confidence and stuff like that and they've done a growth plan um for the next two years and the, it's it's really good and they presented it and they said for the first time they just took every member everybody had input in it yeah. so that everybody owns it and so we talked to them about you know make sure that your check-ins and your follow-ups are done from that's your basis from the basis of where you started together doing something and i think that again we working 
hybrid doesn't mean you're working in a silo. It just means yeah. you're working in a different place. Yeah. And so I think that they're absolutely the checking in, but involve people in the decision-making process. They are smart. <laughs> you know? oh, Not everyone yeah. has nece necessarily the same capacity, but people have ideas that if you, if you keep them hidden or you're not encouraging, that is another reason to quietly quit. I'll just go somewhere where I'm more appreciated. And I think yeah. that there is something about using the resources that you have, because that also then can identify the gaps, where the problems might be, where more resources are needed, and or fewer resources. So I think that there are plenty of things that can be done to go over this hump of quiet quitting so that it isn't passive aggressive on the part of employees and rigid and paternalistic on the part of employers. Yeah. Uh, right now, and why I gave that quite, uh, you know, sort of shocking heading of costing your team, costing you your team, costing you your bottom line is because the ultimate cost of doing nothing would, would be exactly that. And I think every, pretty much every organization out there is struggling to find the skills and the alignment in in the future employees. I know even us, we, you know, our biggest element of our business is employee attraction, talent attraction, and yet we are finding it very difficult to find the right fit for us. And we've gone back to the job description and we've disassembled it and looked at it as, are there two different roles where these skill sets can be found because we can't find all of the skills required in one person. So we're having to rethink that about yeah. how what yeah. our attraction strategy is. But equally important, and especially with the recession, you know, round the corner, yeah, is, yeah pretty much, right? All the results. Um, we need to make sure every employee needs to check that they are doing everything to retain a positive and engaged workforce and that is not a given even if you have a culture you know there's that new phrase another new phrase well it's new for me uh, your evp what's your we know, we've all heard about the mvp most valued person evp is your employee value proposition so what have you done to build that so that your employees choose you you know i'm i'm very aware i think we're all aware that there's Great people are being headhunted all the time from our organisations. We can't stop people from leaving, not physically. But what we can do is make that EVP so strong that they choose us every day that they come to work. And then quiet quitting becomes something that happens elsewhere because we have worked consciously to bring our culture alive. You know, culture is one of those things that, you know, again, I know that this is something we need to do, but it's, you know, we run culture strategy days where we, we revisit what people stand for. We, we revisit what's important to them. Everyone does it from the most senior to the most junior, from the longest standing to the newest person. And you bring that together and create a culture for the people, by the people, because that's the only way culture will work. If, if people feel it's intrinsic rather than put on them. Yeah. What is your sustainability policy? What do, where do you stand in diversity and inclusion? Show examples start having you know days when people from uh, different backgrounds can come and bring alive what what you know who they are and what they stand for so that everyone feels that they belong i think belonging is also a huge factor you know they talk about maslow's hierarchy and you know stability and security is number 1 right you know having enough money to pay for things but actually i think belonging especially since this conscious awakening in the pandemic um, is is everything for employees and uh, belonging and wanting to matter. We all, I don't think there is even the the worst human being. They want to matter in some way. It might have got you know toxic and and distorted, yeah. but we want to matter. And yeah. belonging is a way of mattering. Um, I remember a, a, a coaching a managing director a, a while back who had a bit of a crisis. Of, of conscience conscious crisis of conscience and said what am I doing you know it's all about money it's all about this I should be digging wells in Africa and I said well hold on you know let's think about what your work facilitates you help people create fulfilling careers you help people create joy you help people build families homes roofs over their heads food on their table clothes on their back 
apart from the product you're selling and, and delivering, your role is really important. Yeah. And if we can help everyone understand the impact of their role, because actually, if you step back and look in, as you said, you 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 know you cheer up your colleagues, you, you create a community, you're part of something, and you are so important in that. And we forget to talk about those things day to day. Uh, you know, I'm talking about it today. It's reminding me about little little sessions I can put in for us for the coming year to to keep that alive. And well. It's something that we did. We were working with an organization um, in Wrexham, big factory, okay. and we worked with everyone. We worked with the senior team and the shop floor, and did it. and they finally said, "Oh, we've got this group. I don't know if I've mentioned this before. We've got this little group of women um, that process the pink slips. This isn't. This was in just at the turn of the century, so it was." <laughs> Not okay. that automated. This country, this country. Yeah. They were processing pink slips and they're just totally demotivated. And so we went in and they've all been working there for 20 years. And they were like, and so we said, well, what's the organizational chart? So they drew the organizational chart. Everyone, they went on flip charts and there they were all in this little thing. And so we said, well, we're just going to redraw the organizational chart and you are in the middle. Um, okay. And we want you to say, show how you impact on every department in the company. Yeah. And it was like, oh my God, they were like so happy and excited because they suddenly saw that without them pushing those little pink slips around, nothing would yeah. happen. Yeah. But nobody had acknowledged that. And it was yeah. it was transformational. And so we've used that exercise with other organizations with demotivated departments, but also the people who manage the demotivated departments, yeah. let them see how important they are. Let them see that what their little part in it where it fits into the bigger picture. If you don't do that and you are just coming in and processing the equivalent of little pink slips, you can understand why someone would just say, oh, I'll just do the pink slips and yeah. I won't care. Um, yeah. But you can care if you understand that you are part of something bigger. Yeah, and that's so powerful. I think visuals stand for so much. And I think it's two things I'm going to sort of take from what you said. First of all is motivation, you know, Again, I think where motivation can be like that, I think consistency helps to bring motivation up and therefore the consistency of managers and how they support, how they check in, how they performance manage, the language they use, you know, we know that language shapes behavior. All of this, I think, creates the consistency that fluctuating motivation can hold on to and improve people's motivation because they have that reassurance they have that trust and confidence and then that feeds in but then managers need training too so again yeah. we just um, refined sure our, yeah and we just refined our manager program around recession proofing because again as we knew managers needed a certain set of skills they needed to bring in on top of the day-to-day -day management now recession proofing is about understanding that people again are facing fears and challenges. And actually, I think quiet quitting will become more prevalent where there is more fear because people won't want to leave a job yeah. because, because they're not sure about what the future holds. They don't want to be last in, first out if they move job, it move, move their job. So it's even more important for employers to not look at their attrition rates and think, oh, no one's leaving, we're fine, but actually dig under the skin and, yeah. and get in touch. Well, look at your productivity or look at your sense of, you know, whether you when you're meeting someone either online or in the office, you know, what's the gleam behind their eyes? Is there or is it is it blank? Yeah. Also on the the other side, I know that it, it you know, people are may find it difficult to find another job. But when I've coached, I say commit to staying or commit to leaving. Yeah. One or the other. Quiet quitting is kind of this halfway house. So yeah. I'll just put my feelers out there and I'll just do the minimum here. It's and the there is something way. about when you commit to staying, it means you'll have bolder conversations. You'll have more creative res um, resolu not resolution, solutions yeah. to problems that seemed insurmountable before. Well, they didn't give me a raise. So, uh, and yeah. I said, okay, go back and say, you know, one of the things, a classic is, okay, I can understand you're not prepared to give me a raise now. What's needed for me to get one? When yeah. do we think we could have a review? 
rather than just slinking off and being resentful, yeah. actually, it, there is something about when you commit to staying and you don't get what you want, start looking at what else you could do to be noticed, to be acknowledged, to have more energy around what you do. So, I, you know, I'm yeah. a great believer in that. Commit to staying or commit to leaving. Yeah. And I think for employees watching, this is very powerful because, again, the language shapes behavior. And if you've created, you've said, this is my commitment to myself, this is what I'm doing, all your actions that you then list underneath will be focused one way or another. I think for managers, it's it's harder to get that clarity. So I think managers have to go in with a, we want you, we value you. If there is a disconnect, let's work on bridging that gap. What's it going to take? Let's work on that together. And um, any any employer watching this, I think the first place to look at is employee, well, as you said, Joellen, look at the productivity and engagement, do some surveys, do some analysis, and then look at how you can revive your EVP. Yeah. Look at everything that goes into that. Also, are you hiding? I mean, I do know that some managers don't want to have to deal with it. They also just want to, it's what I said, it's the old firefighting paradigm. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to do what I have to do to get through, as opposed to the broader look, which is commit to your team, yeah. commit to your well, the well-being of your team. I'm a, such a believer in commitment because when I know when I've stopped being committed to something, I feel it in every ounce of my body, my yeah. mind, my spirit. And that's when I will, uh, I'll either change organizations or change countries or who knows what it might be. Yeah. But there is something when you can commit, it, it brings energy, it brings excitement. Yeah. And, it, and I, I keep saying it brings creativity. Yeah. And all of those will enable this individual sitting there with whatever shadow it is that has started to form, whatever cloud has started to form, it disperses that. And we just, I think this is one of these problems or challenges that isn't a tick box exercise. It is a real conscious choice. A bit like when you decide that I'm committing to my relationship and I need to bloody do date night, uh, you know, even if it feels like that's the last thing you want to commit to. It's a bit like that. And I think both employers and employees have to give each other that first date experience and, you know, want to make it really impressive and people want to feel yeah. like we just there's no way better than this for me to give my time and my expertise yeah lovely yeah yeah so joellen we are literally a couple of minutes out from the end of the session i'm hoping that other comments got through or we've just got a quiet room today i know we had a big sign up so it definitely showed that this is a is a you know a, an important topic um but what would your what would your parting thought be on quiet quicken well, I think that if I look at at being active, it's it's the commitment to yourself. Quiet quitting to me, I, I know it might sound pejorative, is quite passive aggressive. So what do you need to be an adult? I am the adult in this situation and I need to find a way to resolve this. So I I stay. Yeah. I stay in this job and I don't just do the minimum. Also, I just want to say one other thing. I think doing the minimum is quite harmful to the self. I yeah. think that you you have to know that your colleagues might be struggling over there and you're saying, nope, nope, not me. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm just doing what my job description says. I, I think it uh, ultimately harms you. Yeah, it, it's like all of those things that for self care we, yeah. we avoid what we need the most. And yeah, so self care you might be doing it because you know I've been working too many hours and I've been yeah. stretched and I've been this and I've been that and it's affected my I'm um, all of the stress and I'm full yeah. of anxiety. But actually, doing the quiet quitting I think will have more harm in the yeah, end. Yeah, it, it's inauthentic and it takes up a lot more energy and headspace and yeah. without any good outcomes, any any positive outcomes. So it's it's unhealthy. And I think what I would say to employers is. If you suspect it's going on, it is. You know, this is no smoke without fire. Trust yeah, absolutely. Trust your instincts. Take the checklist. If, if you want more information or, or if you want any further uh, understanding of, of, of what, what goes into a strong EVP, let me know. I'm on LinkedIn. You've got my email address. Both Joellen and my contact details will be with the recording that you'll get later today. And let's start 
looking into each process and bringing it to life again. You know, whether you do a, a little coaching session, a brainstorm session, a little retraining session, just fit them in over a few months. People will know they're coming and, and you know, call it the EVP breakfast, you know, every 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 first Monday of the month or whatever you decide to do. But yeah. it's definitely it's definitely key to, to, to prioritize that right now. And I Thank think you having me. Oh, Darlene, always a pleasure. And we're going to get the next one in the diary real soon. And okay. uh, I'll be um, back next Thursday, actually. We're trying to not do every week because I feel that there's been a bit of webinar fatigue. But at the same time, we want consistency and regularity because there's a lot of challenges and a lot of flux out there. So we want to be able to bring some solutions to that. Well, thank you, Joellen. And thank you, everyone who signed up and who attended today's webinar. See you Bye -bye. again. Bye for now.